We are calling to, we are calling to order the Tenderloin Futures Collaborative. Um, uh, we, we hope to uh, we're going to give everybody's names. I'm going to turn the camera around, and you're going to give your names if you don't mind. And uh, my name is Susan Bryan. I'm the videographer here. Michael is not here right now, so I am stepping in to moderate or to uh, direct traffic. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I'm Betty Trainer with the Friends of Bodecker Park. Okay. Marjorie Beggs. Wait, let me get you extra. Okay, repeat, please. Marjorie Beggs, Central City Extra. Thank you. Okay, uh, and you, ma'am? I'm Stephanie Ashley with the St. James Infirmary. Good, thank you. I'm uh, Mark Rennie uh, here today with uh, Pandora Security. Jeff Ng, Pandora Security. Okay, thank you. All right. I'm sorry, Marjorie, what did you say? B -E -G -G -S. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Our first speaker is representing Pandora. Uh, relocation of business to 50 Mason, Mark Reddy, and Jeff Ning. Uh -huh. Thank you. My name is Mark Rennie, Jeff Eng. We uh, are here representing Pandora Karaoke, which is a business that's been in the neighborhood for eight years. Uh, uh, one seven. Um, at one set in the basement of 177 uh, Eddy Street, and. Uh, the landlord is basically kicking everybody out of the building. So, so um, we are hoping to get community support to move the business over to uh, 50 Mason Street, which is basically less than a block away. It's down the street to Mason, the first building on the left as you take the right turn. And this was a previously was. The San Francisco Comedy Club until about five years ago, and then it was 50 Mason Social Club, which was basically a bar and live music venue. They unfortunately went out of business um, not too long ago, a few months ago. And um, we have a contingent lease, contingent on the ABC approving the uh, moving of the liquor license. And that's the case, we'd love to move it. It's going to be in the basement, as the 177 Eddy property is also in the basement. We'd love to uh, um, basically get community support and keep the jobs in the neighborhood. We think we've been a good operator. Jeff is the general manager and half owner, and uh, he can tell you a little bit about it. It's been non problematic. I've been working with him for quite a while. We actually had to take this. It's actually a fairly famous case at the Court of Appeals at this point for the ABC Appeals Board because the way the Tenderloin Police Department here has been, it's almost like the Wild West. It's like containment, containment, containment. And uh, new, new places were coming in and getting like 1 o'clock closes and or liquor curfews, and I think you had, what, 12 o'clock or something? Yeah, like 12 or 11. 11 o'clock some days, 12 o'clock, and it was basically killing the business, and uh, we had been a good operator in the business, so it, we kept, we would win at the at the, at the uh, hearing, they would appeal it, then we'd win there, and they'd appeal it, finally went to the, the uh, appeals board, and the appeals board sort of looked at it, and um, did a very interesting 24-page uh, decision, which basically changed the whole lot of things about the, the police's ability to just willy-nilly just put conditions on good businesses where, where they didn't have some reason to do so, other than the fact that, and I think it was pretty much they looked at it, well, if you say the neighborhood is getting better, but it's not good enough yet, the, the, the 
Court of Appeals says, well, when is it ever going to get better if you don't let good businesses in the neighborhood? So I think we've been good operators. And hopefully we can get some support for our move. And uh, Jeff, tell them about, mm -hmm. about what you do. Yeah, so we've been, uh, we've been here for seven years. Um, haven't had any problems or anything like that. We're also members of the uh, 100 Block of Energy Safety Committee. Um, so we're part of the team that tries, is trying to clean up that block. Um, I mean, I think we'll still be active participants even though we won't be on that block anymore. Um, but we've been uh, responsible members, I guess, in this community for a while now, and we'd like to continue. So uh, with your support, we can make that possible. So. Could you say a little bit about Pandora? So Pandora is a karaoke uh, and bar. So what we do is we do both types of karaoke. We do Asian style and we do American style. American style is kind of what you see on TV. People go on stage, they sing, everyone laughs and yells, and people sing, sing along. And Asian style is more private. <clears throat> you get a, your own room, for example, for birthday parties, corporate events. Um, we have bachelor, bachelorette parties, happy hour crowds, corporate get-togethers, team building. We have all that kind of stuff. Um, and we attract good people. We attract business people from downtown. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Facebook, is a frequent client. We get uh, San Francisco Giants. We get San Francisco 49ers. Um, so we get a lot of high-end clientele, and we don't attract uh, any bad clientele. Um, we have security out front every hour that we're open. Um, so that's basically what we do. <clears throat> um, that, I mean, if anybody has any questions. How old was, was you were you've been at the you're at the other location seven years? Is that, the, is that when the <clears throat> started when the business first opened? Yeah, so we opened uh, starting 2010, like maybe a little around like a little November, December 2011. So when we actually got the lease, and then the build out took a little while, um, and then uh, we actually opened our doors sometime in 2010. So been about six and a half, seven years. What are your hours? Six to two. Every day except Monday, 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. So Mondays are only a closed day. I believe individual uh, members of uh, that come regularly to, to this uh, can can individually send letters of support for you. Is that true? Yeah. yeah okay. Sure. Yeah. I believe uh, across the way last week, Marvis said something about us sending a letter of support. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. That'd be greatly appreciated. And we also have to uh, we have to take this to the board of supervisors for a piece of Because okay. once you move a liquor, if you move a liquor license, we may not actually because the old liquor license hasn't been gone so long. It may be that we sort of slid under the radar. Okay. But if not, yeah. we're gonna, we have to take it to the board of supervisors, which is the public safety committee. Mm -hmm. How long has that liquor license been inert? It was it was on there and it was on there and active even after they were evicted. But it was sometime in the fall, and I think last uh, year. Yeah, fall of last year, and I think that it actually it, it may have been right just before we um, applied for the license. But it, uh, the ABC finally, you know, what they have to do if it's paid up, they they have to put it on what's called Rule 64 surrender, and basically say. The business is no longer operating, so we're going to put it on the shelf. Theoretically, we could have bought that liquor license and it would have just put paid the money and reacted. However, that was a, a beer and wine only license. It was a bar. It, it was considered in planning parlance to be a bar because it was no food, liquor. However, it was beer and wine only. We want to add. We want to have beer, wine, and spirits, which are you know, cocktails. So that's the and the, uh, the current owner of the building is, uh, I think he put $5 million into the building. Um, so it's going to add a lot of curb appeals in the neighborhood. I'm sorry, I heard you say the, pre the owner of the building, the current owner right now of the building, 50 five, Yeah, the 50, mas 50 Masons building, uh, invested $5 million into the building. So he's redoing the whole thing and we're about to build out in conjunction with his. I mean, it's going to add a lot of curb appeal to this neighborhood. So I think it's, it's going to be good. It's actually beautiful. I, my client uh, owns a lot of the big, not these guys, but one of the guys who built it, 
original karaoke. <coughs> what he he does a lot. He owned the biggest and most successful nightclub in town at that point. But he also goes to the Far East, and I think what the thing you guys had going, you had absolutely the best karaoke system probably in America at that point when they first started. Because when I first walked in there, I was scratching my head. The first block of Eddie was pretty rough eight years ago, if you remember. People forget, but it's a whole lot nicer now. And when I walked in there, it looked like I'd walked on Union Street. It was really sort of high-end clientele, dressed really nice, no trouble. I'm like, huh? I said, what do they do when they leave? But, it, and he, I guess it was Duck did that, but he, they were very smart. They went to all the big liquor, Hennessy, and Blue Moon, and all these major liquor companies and said, hey, we want you to brand a room. I guess they can do this in the Far East. We want you to brand a room. So give us $10,000 a year and, the, and come in and build a beautiful room. And so the rooms in there are beautiful, beautiful rooms. Beautiful. Right, so you, have you already been evicted from 177? No. When? When is your... Uh, we don't exactly have an eviction date. Uh, we're on a month to month right now. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to move somewhere and get a long-term lease, which we have in place already, uh, pending the the status of the license. Are you looking at other locations? Or no, that one moved pretty set up. I don't know if it's anything pretty well. And we like the area. <laughs> in basement, you know, there's not a whole lot of stuff that's licensed in the basement. See, the, the good thing about basement stuff, especially, you know, young kids and alcohol, you know, mm -hmm. they laugh and they talk and everything like that. So if you have a good sound system and you're first floor, second floor, it tends to spread if you're in the basement it goes nowhere so you know if you walk by 177 on on the weekend you go walk by 177 you're gonna, you, know, you won't hear anything you'll see there's a, a nice entrance way there's a, always a big security guard very friendly who's sitting there keeping his eyes on the entire street because that's one of the things you like you've got nice people in there it's sort of sometimes they're young and they don't really realize where they are and so it's good to have somebody keeping an eye coming in I'm so sorry, I was like, do you mind just um, laughing a little bit? <laughs> what you, what's your name? So, my name is Jeff, I'm with Pandora Karaoke, okay. I'm the owner, and we're moving okay. around the corner to 50 Mason. Um, so, they're, they're I think they're tearing down the building and building more units, isn't that right there? Yeah. It seems to be what's going on in the neighborhood. So, they're basically, the whole building's being uh, vacated and sent and leases and so. And it's a good business, we're trying to just move it close by. Thank you very much. Um, okay. <clears throat> the next 15 minutes is going to be a presentation by the uh, St. James Infirmary, Stephanie, Stephanie Ashley. Director of a nonprofit community based healthcare organization called the St. James Infirmary. And uh, St. James Infirmary has been located over on Mission Street at 10th for the past 13 years, 14 years. Um, and we are in a similar situation to um, our friends of Karaoke Bar, in so far as um, the owner of the building has decided to sell the building and um, tear down the clinic. And so we are looking at um, being displaced very soon. Um, fortunately for us, very, very fortunately for us, um, we were able to um, connect with um, 234 Eddy Street, which you may know um, is a clinic that's sort of been abandoned and that's sitting um, in disuse right now. So um, we uh, reached out to the Department of Public Health who has the master lease on the entire building that's the Windsor Hotel, and inquired about what they were doing with this kind of vacant healthcare clinic. And they um, agreed to um, 
go into a sublease with us to kind of bring some life back into that clinic and also provide us with a new home for our services. So um, we were really fortunate. I know a lot of nonprofits in the city that have been displaced haven't been able to contend with the um, kind of private sector real estate. We were looking at places um, in the private sector and it was just nowhere within our means. So we feel very, very fortunate that we've been able to have this kind of partnership with the Department of Public Health that, like I said, will give us a place to land and will also ho hopefully bring some services um, to an area that can really use them. Um, we see that that space as a really wonderful place to be providing services and feel like it should be in use instead of just sitting there kind of with the lights off. So um, we are hoping to move our services in, um, we're hoping to reopen our services at 234 Eddy Street um, on March 15th. We're looking at a tentative ribbon cutting day of March 14th, I said, sorry, 15th opening for services hopefully cutting the ribbon on the 14th. Um, there's a lot that has to happen before then, so none of those dates are set in stone. Um, but we are um, being asked to leave very quickly um, from the building that we're currently at, so we're trying to, trying to make it happen as quick as we can. The services that we provide are um, for the sex worker community, so people that are current or former sex workers and their families. Um, we provide services to this community for a number of reasons. One is that it's a community that um, doesn't have access to traditional forms of health care. Um, and two, it's a community that often doesn't access other free health care opportunities because of a long history of stigma and discrimination um, with institutions. So um, we started this kind of really unique peer-based model of community health care for this community in 1999. And it's been what I consider to be a very effective model of healthcare. Um, we've been, you know, we've provided consultation to the World Health Organization, um, UN AIDS, and various other kind of global, um, you know, uh, healthcare institutions. And we've had the support of the Department of Public Health for a long time, well, since our inception. So we're currently contracted from the Department of Public Health to provide. Um, mental health services, substance use services, um, and HIV prevention services. So we offer primary medical care, we offer um, individual therapy, group counseling, case management. We have a clinic that is specifically by and for the transgender community where we provide access to hormone replacement therapy, things like that. Um, we do have a, a needle exchange that operates three hours a week. There's already a needle exchange that happens um, out of that exact location on Friday evenings, so that shouldn't be any, any change. Um, and we also do a lot of outreach, so we um, send outreach workers, trained outreach workers, um, out into the Tenderloin, the South of Market, the Mission, and the Polk neighborhoods to just kind of hand out um, you know, healthcare supplies, food, socks, and to provide referrals to services for people who might need them. And then on top of all that, we also use the space as kind of a community building space. So we have things like um, free yoga, or right now we have a fashion design and garment construction class that the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are funding. Um, so we also try and do just sort of fun um, community building activities. Um, and then the last thing is that we also um, partner with two other organizations to do um, kind of more work specifically around the needs of the transgender community and transgender women of color in particular. So um, I'm not sure if anyone remembers about a year ago um, there was a woman named Taja de Jesus who was murdered in the Bayview. She was a young trans woman of color who um, was a community member of ours. And in the wake of her murder, um, a group called the Taja's Coalition was formed which was Transgender Activists for Justice and Accountability. And so that group um, is sort of, they've, they've been um, kind of organizing for a year and St. James serves as the fiscal sponsor for them with the hope that soon they'll be able to be their own standalone 501c3. And then we also um, host the TGIJP, which is the Transgender, Gender Variant and Intersex Justice Project. Um, they do activities like 
um, letter writing nights where volunteers come and write letters to trans people who are in prisons and detention centers around the country to just kind of, um, you know, provide